Sorry, um, let's get started then. I just shared the link to the slides. These are all Google slides. You can do whatever you want with the slides. And uh, that's, you know, we don't keep any copyrights, anything. That's, you can have access to it. Um, you can use this for, you know, other things you want. Um, so today we'll be talking about uh, CUDA programming. And as you know, at, at, at GRC, we have uh, several big computers and we have uh, a lot of nodes with the GPUs on them. Some of those are, um, are the best GPUs available you can find you know, on the market. And uh, I'm sorry. And today's uh, CUDA programming short code will be divided into three parts. The first one is to um, just introduce you to uh, CUDA and also um, let you understand that the GPU itself we are using mostly as an accelerator for our uh, all the computing tasks. So second part, we are uh, trying to show you how to run a simple uh, CUDA code on Grace. And then lastly, I'll talk about some basics about CUDA. So it's kind of ironic. So I think I'll, I'll be spending some time to persuade you not to use CUDA <laughs> in this course, even though uh, it's mostly about CUDA programming. Uh, you'll see what I mean, you know, uh, it's not like completely against you learning CUDA, but I'll be suggesting that to you, if you are a new programmer, and CUDA might not be the first language you want to get started. You want to learn some other things, get yourself familiar with basic programming, you know, structures, and then you, you can use CUDA to help you to, act, act, to accelerate part of your application, or you can rewrite your code completely into CUDA to leverage the computing power of GPUs. So the first thing I think it would be uh, for us to get started is probably easier just to get started to get on our portal. Uh, I have a button here that you can link for those who are um, here uh, in person. Um, I shared the link to the slides. Do you have a link to the slides as well? So good, all three of you have. How about you? Uh, you do you have access? I don't have it. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll share to the chat room one more time. Sure. So you can just click the button gets there or you can just directly visit HPRC or, you know, I'm sorry, this one is uh, the old link. I, I This one should need to be updated. But anyway, um, if you go to the HPRC portal, uh, and this one's link uh, pointing you to the Terra one, which is not the one we want. You can go to HPRC, um, I'm sorry, portal. If you go to HPRC website, hprc.tamu.edu, so there is a link to the portal here. You can click Grace portal. This will take you to the portal uh, for Grace. And you can see the interface to both the Terra and Grace portals are the same. Uh, we are using the same uh, um, software pan called Open on Demand to set things up like this. And uh, since you know we are not asking you all to log in remotely through other clients, uh, like uh, you know mobile X terminal that we used to before. If you're using uh, Mac, you know there's X terminal or terminal that you connect and directly to our server with a SSH connection. But if you're on Linux, it will be much simpler. You can directly use SSH to run it through your terminal. And we are using the portal command line interface. It's called the Grace Shell Access. This is what you will see if you click the portal shell access. Let me zoom in a little bit more. You'll be asked to you know, type in your password. That should be your Tamu credential. And if you're offline, make sure you connect through VPN. This is only accessible through VPN off campus. If you're on campus, you should be able to log in your you know, Tamu um, account and get access to this page. So you need a, to do the dual authentication. I'm here, let me log in myself. Um, where is it? I'll probably just take too long and let me refresh it.
So after you log in, that's what you will see. If you if you, this is your first time getting on system, uh, you probably want to read the you know what's printed on the screen here. The first one is about some information about our edge um, policies and and other things, and um, then you are get a warning message. You know there are some sometimes we'll, we'll post some important information like maintenance dates and other things here as well. You can you can take a look and uh, you can read those when you log in, and also. This will also show you the quota of your files on your home directory and the scratch space. The command line to, to run this one more time is just in case you want to check you know, how much um, uh, storage space you have used or how many files you have used so far. There's a quota about those. And since it's a shared system, you need to obey all the rules and to make sure this one is usable by everyone. Um, here and and um, so show quota is a uh, command line to repeat. So after you get on, that's basically almost you're almost done for the first uh, step. That I want to show you all here and go back to the slides. So you get the grace shell access to it, and then you uh, do the dual authentication and you log in. And uh, now, if you want to try it. Uh, we can try it all together, or you can go back and ch check check this one more time. Let me just do this with you, uh, together with you, so that you know what uh, this one is about. Let me go back to the shell access. Where is it? Uh, it's logging. Uh, this one. So you can do a quick module load. Either do module load, which is a longer version of that. We have a shorthand called ML, module load, capital case CUDA. So what is this does? Uh, it will load the module CUDA for you. And you know this is not a recommended practice, but for, for us to get access to a system for the first time, uh, you can directly do module load CUDA because this will load the latest version of CUDA for you. Uh, so you have all the NVIDIA compiler, paths, or other things. properly set in your command line uh, environment. So you can just try a very simple, you know, if you're familiar with C, you, know, you can try a very simple CUDA code just using C. I have a one simple word here, just a print hello word out. There's nothing simpler than this in C. You just need to include a STDIO, the standard IO library, and uh, your main function, and then print F is a formatted print, and get hello world. If you're not familiar with VI, there's another one called a Nano uh, that you know some people might be familiar with. Sorry, not a CU. So Nano is you can use uh, your up key and down key and left and right to move your cursor. You can just do it like a regular um, editor. Uh, but when you quit, you can use a control X as the bottom here. You'll see bottom left here, you can see there is a, you know, carrot X, which is a control X, well quit. So this is when you, when you want to do this on command line, but if you want to use a, your own editor to do this, I'll show you how to do that in a second. But um, if you don't want to go through this step, it's fine. I just want to make sure you know this mode, you know, module load CUDA. That will load all the modules. And as a, if you want what kind of module you are loaded, uh, you can use ML. This will show you the modules that you loaded. This is just CUDA. And uh, if you're not using Python and Python and other libraries, this is all you need for this short course. But if you want to do, you know, development, if you need some other libraries, you will need to load more modules. And we currently have a 11.4 version, which is um, not so bad. The latest stable version is 11.5, uh, but 11.4.1 is already you know, pretty close to the latest version. And a lot of features you need for the new architecture should be already there. Okay, that's for the very, very first part of our short course, just get you all on our uh, system. You don't even need any terminals to be installed. There are no clients needed. It's a web-based interface. It's very, very convenient for beginners. But after you get familiar you know, with, with Linux and other things, you probably want to install a, you know, a client 
which has probably more powerful control, et cetera. You can, you can do more, many more things with it. Okay, so we'll get back to the command line interface in a second, but uh, let's, let's get started with our uh, short notes. Actually, you know, I just check a three of you. Are, are you all getting there? Yeah. Say, okay, that's great. That's, that's a good starting point. Uh, any problems on the Zoom? Uh, all the remote attendees, do you have any problems to get, uh, um, sorry, to use the um, command line interface, get on our portal? Okay. No means probably everyone's fine with it. Cool. Okay, let's uh, get started. Let me hide this. I'm sure if this will hide automatically. Okay, good. So the part one, we'll just talk about GPU itself as an accelerator. So if you are, you know, since everyone's using a computer anyway, otherwise you wouldn't be able to log in. So in your computer, you all have a GPU, you all have a CPU. Most, most of the laptops, the, G, uh, the CPU is, you know, you have either M1, Lattice AMP uh, CPU, or Intel, or MD, and those are the main windows for CPU. But for GPUs, um, a lot of laptops are using so-called embedded GPU uh, devices. Those are cheaper and you know, not so powerful. Um, some of them are not so good at doing uh, 3D rendering and doing all the computing stuff. But today we'll be talking about so-called uh, discrete GPU card, so-called uh, you know, uh, general purpose GPU card. Most of the uh, cards that NVIDIA is sending out as could be called a general purpose GPU card because they're already supporting CUDA platform, CUDA architecture, and you can do a lot of computation with that, not just doing you know, the visualization stuff, rendering your images and uh, uh, give you the display output, etc. So that's the GPU nowadays is already going beyond the traditional what GPU is supposed to be doing. Basically, you know, give you a, a help with uh, uh, visualization um, and the display of your uh, computer. So GPU accelerator here, we are treating GPU itself as an accelerator and, and more or less a co-processor with your CPU. Um, uh, Intel is working on that. They are working on their own uh, GPU and they can do similar things like what NVIDIA GPU can do. AMD has their router map. They have an integrated GPU or CPU can do both CPU work and GPU work. And if you're following the latest development on the, uh, on the architecture and, and chip design stuff, uh, you'll know probably you know, uh, uh, there are a lot of active uh, development along this line. So, NVIDIA Tesla A100, those are the GPUs in our uh, Grace Soaping computer. It has 54 billion transistors in it. It's, you know, just imagine how, um, you know, once the technology now this has. On our um, uh, Grace, uh, in our Grace Soaping computer, we have, uh, I'm not sure how many, uh, da, da, da. Um, I forgot the exact number of the GPU nodes we have, but, we all have this uh, A140 gig uh, GPU card in it. Basically, it means it has, for each GPU card, it has a 40 gig memory, GPU memory in it. And in each node, we have 350 or 40, I believe 354 uh, uh, gigabytes of main memory. So how much memory do you have in your laptop? 16, 32 maybe? Just imagine how much more you can do with our big machine. Just one node. We have several hundred nodes like that. Uh, so if you have a very big problems and our system are just ideal for big problems, big data, big science problems. Um, so that's the A100, that's the latest the GPU you have. So, so why do we want to use the GPUs? If you just consider, if you're just using CPUs, um, the, you know, one, I'm here I'm, I'm just um, uh, listing one of the traditional CPU best cluster. It's called, a, I believe it's called a Jangua at uh, one of the DOE labs. It's capable of doing uh, 3 point, uh, 2 point 3 petaflops petaflop, operation per second, you know, there's flops per second, petaflops per second, p flops. And it takes up seven megawatts, seven megawatts. And that's a lot of power to power, you know, 7,000 homes uh, just to run this computer. So power efficiency and, and power consumption is a big consideration for uh, big machines like uh, Grace and Terra, all these kind of big systems. If you're talking about a national scale, large 
a system like this, uh, power consumption is a very, very big concern. Uh, in some cases, you probably needed to just build a, um, you know, a power plant next to your supercomputer just to be able to run your supercomputer. And also cooling is another big concern. If you use this much energy to run it, you need a similar amount of energy to just to cool it down. Otherwise, you keep uh, you know, creating, uh, uh, generating heat and your machine will have problems. So cooling is also another consider extra burden to your uh, power network. So compared to CPUs, the GPUs have been proved, you know, it's people have been demonstrating this um, um, in their test and many real life applications as GPUs are much more efficient as far as the power is concerned. When you talk about calculating the uh, similar, you know, computing node. And uh, so if you, your problem is, is, could it be easily divided into smaller pieces? It's much more efficient to use a GPU just to help you do the job. So that's why we are here to want to learn a bit more about how to use a GPU to help us to do things faster. Um, this is a, a snapshot I take on the uh, NVIDIA website. Uh, basically, it shows some uh, GPU computing applications. So this week, the NVIDIA GTC is ongoing. Uh, started probably early this week. And um, if you follow some, some you know, videos, uh, some links from uh, NVIDIA website, the keynote talk uh, given, I think, early this week is very good. You know, the CEO, uh, Jin Jin Huang, I think he presented a lot of latest progress and latest uh, development made by NVIDIA folks. NVIDIA is not just a hardware company now. They have a very big uh, uh, brand doing software development. They are working with different application developers and different uh, uh, vendors, manufacturers. They are trying to develop all kinds of li you know, libraries and middleware for developers. So since you know, I'm not affiliated with as NVIDIA, but I do have this um, um, connection with the Deep Learning Institute at NVIDIA. We are hosting a lot of workshops with NVIDIA people, and sometimes I'm just helping them to host those workshops myself. Um, we also invest a lot. I mean, we here, I mean, HPRC and also uh, Tamu, we are happy investing a lot in the NVIDIA GPUs, not just you know, with us. A lot of departments are buying their own cluster, buying their own hardware with the GPU cards. So it's, it's a dominant you know, uh, <clears throat> factor uh, in this market. And uh, people are concerned about getting locked to particular windows. It's, 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 a, it's a legit concern. And so if you really want to develop something that, uh, that could be used by other windows, you should be careful not to try not to use uh, CUDA because CUDA can really be used and run on, on uh, Vindia uh, products. But anyway, so NVIDIA has all the products here. They are already, uh, you know, occupying a, a big chunk of the market share, not just in one, you know, high performance computing community, they're also in embedded uh, systems and also consumer market, everyone playing a game that probably know, you know, NVIDIA cards are doing pretty good. Uh, they also have a lot of professional uh, level uh, cards that uh, people use this for, you know, doing visualization, rendering all the animations, and also, of course, uh, Bitcoin mining, right? That's, that's why it's, a, it's a driving all the price like crazy uh, in the last several years. Um, so this one shows a very, very uh, high level picture about how CPUs and GPUs can work together to access your science and also engineering, not just science uh, applications. So consider you have your application code and center. And it's already written, for example, you've already finished you know, the, the major, major trunk, uh, trunk of your code that it can run uh, accurately on the CPU code. You have already verified and validated your code. So that's the case in most uh, applications. There's already some code you know, already written in Fortran or C or even Java to do some scientific calculations for you. But now the question is, if you want to run this faster, how to use the GPU to help you to ask the resume? So the very first thing you do, just like when you're, someone give you a code and you try to uh, optimize it, you do the profiling, right? The profile, uh, profiler, there are many profilers. Bprof is probably one of the most popular ones in the open source community. And uh, uh, NVIDIA has their own profiles, their um, systems 
for the system side, or there are other couple systems that are designed just to help you do all the visualization and profiling and stuff. So then you can easily see the hot spots in your code. When you do the profiling, profiler usually gives you uh, a distribution of about time taken to run your code. For example, if a code is running 10 minutes and a profiler can tell you, you know, what's the percentage of CPU usage for your code, for a particular chunk of code, particular function. And that will definitely help you to <clears throat> figure out the so-called hotspots. And these hotspots are the ones just, you are most interested in optimizing because those hotspots are the ones taking most time. And those are the ones, well, you know, if you port those to actuators, those will be most likely to give you some benefit directly. You don't want to spend like, um, you know, uh, a month just to port like 10% of your code, uh, to port your code that only takes 10% of time, two dogs can play. You want to, you know, focus on those 90% of your contents. That's exactly what this one is about. The green lines showing here, especially telling you these are the hot, you know, other part of your code that probably take the majority of your computing time. Actually, in many, many cases, um, it's not the, the lines of code. You know, someone give you a big code, actually the real compute, computer intensive part is only a couple of functions inside. It's called, we call those numerical kernels. Those kernels usually doesn't take much space. Just so you, if you just count the lines of the code, but those are taking a lot of your computing time. So find, find those lines of code and uh, figure out the internal structures of the code and uh, convert them into CUDA as the, one of the most urgent tasks for many application developers nowadays, actually. Probably not nowadays, probably a decade ago, you know, that's when CUDA get, uh, started getting popular. And that's a lot of work uh, people have been, uh, a lot of programmers, scientific programmers have been working on. I was one of those programmers back then when I was a graduate student and also a postdoc. I was working on some of code like this. So, if you look at the HPC system, let's just you know look at the, the 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 bottom of the whole hierarchy, the hardware side. Um, this is a roughly the the layout or structure of a computer that you can think about a cluster. I'm just putting two nodes here. Just consider we have a network. Network could be you know uh, infinity band. It could be you know many other um, high uh, performance networking system. So I just put two nodes here. In each node, I have a memory, uh, you know, a chunk of a big chunk of memory. As I just mentioned on Grace, on each node we have 380, I'm sorry, 80, probably 380 gigabytes of memory um, that could be shared by the whole node. And then in each node we have more, you know, here sometimes you have more than two. We have two sockets here. Each socket is like a physical CPU, it's called one socket. And on each socket you have you know, multiple cores. Here I'm just showing two cores, but in our, on Grace, we have how many cores? Edge cores, at least. Yeah, I believe edge cores in each CPU, uh, or 16, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry, I needed to double check. Someone? <laughs> how many cores do you have? Edge cores on Grace for each CPU? Yeah. yeah, okay, so you have, you know, two core or two sockets, so you have 16 cores. If you're talking about hyper-threading, you can divide one physical core into two threads, then you multiply that by two, then you get more threads. Um, but those are the, the hardware. But now, in addition to CPUs, you know, two physical sockets, you have extra PCI slots you can plug in stuff. Um, Grace, we have, on Grace, we have, you know, if you are familiar with our system, if we have a multiple login nodes. We have login nodes without TPUs. We have a login nodes with A100 GPU. With a, we have a login nodes with, with, uh, uh, with RX, RTX 6000. We also have a login nodes with a T4. So those are very good login nodes, uh, no, very good computing resources for you to do machine learning and deep learning applications. But that's the hardware. Again, you know, in addition to uh, GPUs, you might be using Xeon files, you know, which is already you know, deprecated by Intel. It's, it's not a on the market anymore, but I put a slide here just in case you know that there are some development along that line. FPGAs could be also plugged into your PCI slot. And uh, some of us have been working on IPUs, intelligence processing unit from GraphCore. Uh, there are also some uh, uh, DPUs, 
uh, data processing unit. It's more or less like a you know a, a network card. And also you have um, uh, what's uh, was it uh, TPUs tensor processing unit by Google. And there are many other you know similar accelerators. You can plug into your system and use those as a co processor. In the same way, you can use with uh, GPUs. So there are many options nowadays. So this one is mostly about how to do the parallelization with your program. Given a program, um, there will be a chunk of part of the code that could be parallelizable, and a part of the code cannot be parallelized. And here I'm showing a picture of one of the um, highway fee collection, I think a highway station that they collect fees you know, when you're getting out of the highway. To the left here, um, that's the cars getting off the highway. Uh, that's somewhere near Beijing after one of the national days in the last couple of years, from 2018 or 2017, I forgot. So the right here, that's where they get to the local road. You know. So think about this. To the left here, that's a part of the code you can parallelize. By increasing the number of lanes, technically, if you can, if you increase the number of lanes to infinity, your code could be finished, you know, close to zero. So time will be taken will be zero. You know, if you can do, we are just taking a limit, right? If you increase the number of lanes to infinite, the, the time taken to go start from uh, start to the finish could be zero. I'm just you know, thinking about the small channel. Don't 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 try to connect with the traffic uh, uh, jams. Just think about. You, you, your code start to running. And then if you increase the parallelized let each piece to run efficiently, and you can you can um, have an infinite amount of uh, uh, you know threads you can run your code. If your problem could be divided infinitely small, then you are taking almost zero time to finish. So that's a that's a you know audio case. But as a problem, no matter how good you write your program, no matter how good you are writing your program. Uh, there's always part of the code need to be serialized. For example, when you're writing your C code, there's always a main function. That's the entrance. You need to everyone you know, needed to get into this main function and get started popping up. So this uh, uh, the, the the parts that cannot be parallelized actually controls how good how uh, what what your ultimate parallelization could be. So that's exactly what this Amdas law is about. What you know, I'm not going into this formula, but you can take a look and, and think about it yourself. So the maximum speed you can get is actually a speed up you can get. It's completely controlled by the part cannot be serialized. So that's why profiling is very, very important. Doing profiling can give you some you know, rough est estimate about the maximum speed up you can get with your application. So that's very, very, very important. When you talk with your PIs, stakeholders of the code, your, your, if you're working in the future with your managers, if someone, if they just give you a code, give you $1 million for you to parallelize it. So if you can get $1 million, you know, if you can parallelize it to get like 100%, 100 speed up on this node, on this cluster. As a problem, if you look at the code carefully, you'll see that, you know, the maximum you can get probably only 60 times speed up because there is another, you know, certain chunk of code cannot, cannot be parallelized. So that's a time that you know that, you know, where your limit is. Um, I'm just here, for example, you know, um, uh, the, you know, I, I'll talk about that in, 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 in probably in another place uh, after this. But that's the basic idea. Whenever a code is given, it's written, and you, uh, the, the, the structure is laid out, you can look at the code and, and analyze that, even without, you know, writing a single line of code. That's very important to understand the, the whole problem at a very high level. So getting back to CUDA. So CUDA provides everything for you, uh, the library, the development environment, the compiler tool chains, and even the hardware. That's everything is from the, the, if you can call the whole system like a CUDA you know, ecosystem. That's what NVIDIA has been investing a lot of money to create in the last several, uh, many last, probably last 10 years. Um, let me go back to the, okay, let's go to the same slide. So, with all the tools, uh, there are multiple ways to accelerate your applications. Uh, if you categorize them, you can probably think about three basic ways to how you can actualize, actualize your application. Even an application, the easiest way, the way I'll be recommending, highly recommending, is to look for libraries. 
Because you know, Nvidia engineers, you know, it's pretty hard to get into Nvidia. The reason is that they have the highest, the best out of the best, right? They have the best programmers and uh, best uh, people who are working on those libraries. And they are having spending their career. Many of them have been there, you know, Nvidia for multiple decades and working on different libraries. They have been spending their career just to optimize the code for the hardware that know every bit of detail. How can you beat them? There's no easy way you can beat the video engineer talking about performance. So if you can easily switch some of your libraries out with video libraries, that's probably the best you can get for your performance. Um, of course, it's usually it's hard to, to map your problem directly to what the program, the library can help you, but it's always a good way to try the libraries first. Um, so that's my first suggestion, you know, whenever you get a library and with a, with a drop-in replacement, you can easily do that. Um, again, the, the reason is that it's easy to use and it's just needed to, you know, in many cases, if your library is like open standard library, like the linear algebraic libraries or even, even some Python libraries could be easily replaced now. That's like in the GTC keynote, as the CEO mentioned about uh, the new packet called the CU uh, numerics, you know, they have been releasing CU DF and some other libraries to replace the standard Python libraries, like um, uh, NumPy, Pandas, Network X, those could be replaced directly with uh, CUDA libraries. So that's why, you know, uh, they, they, are, they are building up their ecosystem. That's also good news for developers. If you already have a code written in the standard libraries, just replace them. So these are some tools, you know, some libraries I uh, listed previously, there, there'll be many, many more. If you go to the website, just search keep you accelerated libraries, you know, you'll see a tons and tons of libraries listed in different areas, different applications, mostly focusing on uh, mathematical, you know, uh, solvers and, uh, and a lot of them are focusing particular type of uh, library uh, algorithms. Is this limited to that's a good question. So most of them are, they are just providing interface for C and C++. So it's limited to C and C++. But the good news is with the Python rampers, all this, a lot of this, they have a Python uh, rampers you can directly call with your Python libraries. Uh, also Fortran has a CUDA Fortran and you can call some of the libraries, but some of the, them that don't provide an easy plugin for Fortran code. Uh, but again, um, you know, that's something can rapidly change. Rap can quickly change. So they will be providing all this library. But at least for beginners, if you are starting with CUDA, I think the best way to get started with the C or C++. And those library can directly call and you can directly, you know, put that into your product and, and application. So C and C++ is the, uh, is the, the language of your choice if you are, are going to work with uh, CUDA code. So this is one example for, you know, just show you how easy it is. Uh, just to use uh, the CUDA library. For those of you who are um, familiar with, um, with, with, uh, with uh, linear libraries, this is uh, uh, LePank. So SXPY, this is actually a simple function to do A times X plus PY. So AXPY is A times X plus, plus Y. That's a, that's a very simple function, it's X plus Y. That's a, a lot of, it's like a file, a fine transformation of a, of a matrix, of a vector. So this is a very common way of using these libraries to do this. It can help you to, you just need to provide your X and Y, it will give you this X plus one. So for CUDA, what you need to do, just need to change the name from that previous one, SX plus Y to CUDA plus um, uh, SX plus Y. And then you needed to allocate memory on GPUs with a malloc and a man copy. And then you just need to compile with the Kublas library and that's it. So this will automatically copy the data from CPU to GPU and, and, uh, <clears throat> and help you to, uh, <clears throat> to do the calculation quickly on GPU directly. And then you all, all need to do is just need to switch the name of the function and uh, copy the data. I'm sorry, you probably need to copy the data there. Sometimes it depends on how these libraries are written. Sometimes you can directly use uh, uh, the CPU memory data. It will automatically handle the uh, data movement. Sometimes you need to copy the data to the uh, uh, memory, GPU memory, and it calls a function. What, but, what is the difference between CUDA and GPU? Are they similar? 
Oh, I mean, um, so CUDA here, CUDA, CU plus is uh, using CUDA to do the whatever BLAST is doing. BLAST is a library, uh, algebraic library. Uh, so CUDA here is just something you need to do all the manual caching yourself. So if you're using CU plus, CU plus will automatically allocate memory and do all the things for you, but with extra um, benefit. And because the memory will be laid out properly to do all the linear uh, applications. Uh, but if you're using CUDA directly, it's okay, but you'll be help, you, you'll be need, you're, you're needed to manage all the, uh, all the other things yourself, relative to near algebra. So CU plus here is just help, it's just library, based on top of CUDA, help you deal with the near algebra is more efficient. It's just designed to deal with um, all the vectors and, and the metrics. Um, this is just for managing the data locally uh, for the different libraries. And Manlock is a standard library for CUDA, but the other one, it's more or less like a ramper built on top of Manlock with some extra things, help you to deal with the linear algebra uh, calculations. For example, in CUDA, you wouldn't have this set vector function, but uh, uh, I'm sorry, in CUDA, in CUDA, you wouldn't have this, but in CUDA, it will provide this function for you to initialize vectors and doing other things. So libraries are the, are the best way to uh, port your code onto GPUs. Um, so that's why I, you know, even though this is a CUDA core, a short course, but we, um, I think, we needed to, uh, you know, get more about, know more about libraries and which library can help us before we start doing all the CUDA programming directly from scratch. So this slide lists some of the tools, uh, you know, help you to compile stuff and also some debugging solutions if you are doing development. Um, they're also on the NVIDIA CUDA tools and ecosystem. So that's the first one, using libraries. The second uh, way to access your applications is to use so-called uh, directives. There's a directive, so directives. So these directives are more or less like uh, comments your code. Um, if you develop your code with OpenMP, you should know, you know OpenMP is it's kind of very, very similar to OpenCC. There are also some discussions about merging these two, but it turns out two communities that, that don't work well with each other. One consider their, their standard is the best, another one considers their is the best, but they are very, very similar. Um, so OpenSC derivatives are helpful for you to uh, easily port your numerical kernels to GPUs. The one I'm showing here is one example, uh, Fortran example. If you look and see, the green line I'm showing here is a SEC. Let's see if I can. No, I don't have the. So the the dollar sign, the the acceleration symbol, dollar SEC kernels, that tells a Fortran compiler that is capable of uh, you know, not every Fortran compiler can do that, uh, but for the Fortran compiler or CUDA Fortran compiler, then it can take a look at this code, and. Uh, and the compiler will know that this section inside of this, uh, this so-called pragmas are uh, the parts that the user wants to be optimized and, and uh, uh, accelerated on GPUs. So it will take this part and compile it uh, with a CUDA internal compiler. And then this will be, um, the, the compiled functions will be loaded uh, when you run this code to GPU. So this part will be offloaded to GPU when you run this code. Uh, the only thing you need to do is just to tell the compiler that this is a chunk, this is a chunk of code I want to optimize on my, uh, uh, I want to accelerate with GPU. So this will rely a lot on the compiler itself. Um, I know the, uh, the GCC, I believe it's supporting OpenC to some extent, but not uh, all the derivatives, uh, you know, could be, uh, will be supported. And uh, NVIDIA compilers support this uh, nicely. And also the PGI compiler, which is PGI is another compiler company was bought by NVIDIA many years ago. They are working primarily to help with uh, developers to work on this open SEC uh, derivatives. So open SEC derivatives, as I mentioned, is very similar to OpenMP. It's how it helps you to do the multiple threading, but here's a multi, multiple multi threading is done on GPUs instead of CPUs. For OpenMP, all the multiple threading will be done on CPUs automatically for you with a compiler. 
Um, I believe we'll have a short course on OpenP also already done, I think. I'm not sure if it's already done, right? Oh, it's going on. So, so you'll have, you know, you'll see a lot of similarities between OpenSC and OpenMP uh, if you look into the details about OpenSC. So it's a standard, uh, it's very easy to use. All you need to do is just adding comments in your code. And uh, it's open, uh, in a sense, the standard itself is open. But the compiler sometimes, you know, for some compiler, you need to pay a fee, but it's, there are some other open source compilers can help you to deal with uh, multi core processors as well. And it's kind of powerful. Uh, if you look at some of the examples here, I was attending one of their so called GPU hackathons, and we took uh, our coastal modeling code to the, to the hackathon, to the hackathon workshop. Um, there are some, I believe, that back then there were some video engineers that, that also attended the hackathon help you to optimize your code. So you needed to identify the chunk of your code that could be optimized. And then you needed to just insert some programmas, just, just test things out. It's just like a try and error uh, kind of thing. You don't know, you know what's the best uh, strategy is when you get started, but gradually after you get to know more and more about your code structure, um, the, the OpenSC might be working like magic. So last one is to directly use in the program. A programming language like a CUDA. So, you know, if you don't think the libraries can help you much, and if you don't want to mess around with OpenSC, then your last uh, uh, resort will be the programming language CUDA. CUDA has this maximum flexibility. You can do a lot of things that libraries and OpenSC cannot do. And you needed to dig very deep into your code. Uh, you need to dig, dig into the loops levels, you know, inside the loops. OpenSC will be some you know something you, you will be dealing with outside of the, the the internal loops but for when you're writing CUDA code you need to dig into the the loops you need to figure out what's the best strategy to make full use of all the cores available for you to do the computation to you know even though CUDA you know is definitely the primary language you want to write your code but there are a lot of rampers here MATLAB has libraries to for you to port to CUDA, um, in a way similar to OpenC, but but I think a lab, a MATLAB has uh, uh, all the rampers for the CUDA function calls that can go deeper than what OpenSC can do. Like Mathematica, Lambda, they all have the interface rampers for the CUDA code. And for Fortran, you can use OpenSC, you can use a CUDA Fortran, uh, which are which is different from OpenSC, but they do support that uh, for the latest Fortran compilers that support both. Yes. Are these libraries or are these programs? These are programming languages, in a sense. Like OpenC itself, like it's a derivative, it's a directive that you are treating those more or less like uh, comments, but those are part of the programming language. You need to write this into your code to make it happen. It's not a library you can call and, and just use. These are compilers and programming languages that have their own syntax and grammars you need to follow. Like OpenCL is open computing language. It's it's portable across multiple CPUs and GPUs. Uh, and uh, Intel is pushing hard on OpenCL, and AMD is pushing hard on OpenCL. Um, it's supported on NVIDIA GPUs, but NVIDIA since it has the old CUDA, it's, it doesn't you know spend a lot. Uh, NVIDIA doesn't spend a lot of time and effort to push hard on OpenCL itself. But it's kind of similar. OpenCL and CUDA they are kind of similar. Many ways, use many ways. Also, in Python, you have multiple Python libraries. You can directly use a Python, uh, use a CUDA uh, libraries. They will, they will wrap your code into CUDA code. They'll, sometimes they'll do the code generation. And then they will call the CUDA compiler to compile code and run it. And also, Java and Julia they have also linked it to CUDA as well. So, so there are many, many ways, but fundamentally, they are all leveraging CUDA. Uh, code. They either generating CUDA themselves or do something related with the CUDA compilers to help them with the final uh, compilation. But uh, all this will be based on the CUDA architecture. So I'm not going to this one, but this is also interesting project called Thrust. So you can write your own C++ code. This Thrust will be able to generate OpenMP code and also also, also generate CUDA code for you automatically. It has this building uh, code generation strategy. Uh, for you to generate code for multiple architectures. 
so many other things you know we can learn and uh, is there, you know I, I just put some links here you can uh, check them out i believe all of them should be still there but it's possible some of them might be you know outdated Yes, because all the GPUs we we have on the Grace and the Terra, they are NVIDIA GPUs. So this works better than OpenMP. Yeah, definitely on on GPUs, OpenMP won't work. But 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 OpenMP that 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 I believe the, they are trying to support GPUs as well. I'm not sure about the latest development, but as far as I as I know, OpenMP. Um, it's not working very well on GPUs, but it, I believe some versions, for the latest uh, development version of OpenMP standards, they're supporting, they're supporting GPUs, but it's not widely supported by all the compilers. Um, so OpenMP might be working on, on probably some newer version of uh, uh, you know, CUDA architecture, but I'm not sure if it's uh, supported widely. Um, so if you just developing, you know, CPU code, OpenMP should be fine. But if you want to use uh, GPUs, CUDA or OpenC might be the way to go. Yeah. Let's take a short break uh, for probably, you know, five minutes and we'll get back to our part two and I'll get our hands dirty on Grace and try to run some CUDA code there. Um, and then we'll go into the details about CUDA because, you know, it's, if I show you how CUDA works and we are probably, you know, uh, running out of time to do it. So I think it's probably good for us to just get our hands dirty, get yourself familiar with the environment. And then you can just spend a bit more time learning all the details in the future. Okay. Number two, let's, let's get back to our 225, should be fine. 225, now it's 219. Okay, let's get back. So in this part, we will try to run a simple CUDA code on Grace and uh, we'll see how that work. So Grace has, um, I mentioned four logging nodes, no, five logging nodes. One, two, three are all uh, GPU enabled with the NVIDIA GPUs. The first one is the most powerful one with A100, with 40 gig GPU memory, which is very powerful. And then uh, Grass 2 has NVIDIA uh, RTX 6000. You know, for those of you who play games, those are fabulous game, gaming uh, uh, GPU card. It's a desktop version, a workstation version. Uh, also NVIDIA T4, these are used a lot for inference for deep learning and neural network related research. So the last uh, two nodes, Grass 4 and Grass 5, if you are the one uh, who have been assigned to these two nodes when you log in Grace, uh, you, you probably need to SSH to one of those with uh, GPUs. I'll show you how to do that in a second. As I mentioned, at each node has 384 gigabytes of memory on each one. It's not on, you know, it's a shared, it's just each one will have this much memory. That's a lot of memory. And we have 48 cores. Uh, if it's a two socket, so each one probably 12. I'm not, it's, it's not eight, I'm sorry. So each, each socket will have um, uh, 12 cores and we have two sockets uh, in it. So that's how you get uh, 48 cores uh, in it. Yeah. So we have 12 cores. Uh, what's second? For node, we have 48 cores. Right? Uh, you need to do the math right. That's uh, two by two and then you have 24, uh, 24 cores, I'm sorry. For each socket. And then we have a, a pretty big uh, local storage. I'm um, sorry, uh, this is not a local storage, it's not that big, but it's pretty fast. It's a 40, 480 gigabytes SSD drivers. So those are pretty fast. And uh, 1.6 uh, terabytes of uh, NVMe, those are high speed uh, storage system. Okay, now assuming we are logging to this node, you have logged into this node already. Um, the very first command I want you to try, it's called NVIDIA-SMI. -SM it's NVIDIA System Management Interface. Uh, this is probably the easiest way for you to check the status of GPUs running on our machines. 
And you can easily see the, there are three, you know, if you look at the top columns, there are three columns here. The first column is give you basic uh, information about the power usage, the name of the GPU, et cetera. The second column is about the memory usage, percentage of memory usage. Totally, we have 40 gigabytes of memory. And uh, here, since I don't have anything running, it's used zero megabytes of memory. And the last column here is the more or less like, like a GPU utilization. What's the percentage of GPU utilization uh, for, for, the, uh, for the application? And to the bottom here, there are multiple lines here. I don't have any process running, so you don't, have, you don't see anything. If you do have a, a CUDA code running and then using the GPU, your, your process will be showing here and you should be able to see the process ID and also you know, other information uh, here in the memory usage. So let me go back to my dashboard. Okay, so if you let me see if so top is a command I usually use to check the running process. Use you know. Um, If you can check your current uh, host, if you look at the left of your prompt here, you should see grace one, two, three, four, or five. There. If you are the unlucky one on grace four or grace five, uh, you need to SSH to grace one or grace two, or you know, probably I recommend you to log into grace one. And that's, that's what you'll see. You just need to log in doing whatever you just did. You'll get to grace one. SSH will switch you to a different node. Um, so if you are uh, to work to your local machine, oh, Terra to go, you can do the same thing. SSH grace, you know, one grace two, or you can directly SSH to grace. You can also do that. Switch from Terra to grace. I'm sorry, probably some of you are just confused by this link here. Actually, the, the this link. Is supposed to be linked to uh, linked to Grass, not Terra. If you are linked to Terra, then you have to uh, make sure you you log in use the the Grass portal. That's where you should get started anyway. Okay. Now uh, there is something I want to show you all here on the dashboard. There is a files link. You can directly. Click, click the home directory or scratch space. So what I'm doing here, I just cry, click the scratch space. I have a couple of folders already you know, created. I can click it. I can say, I go to one of the say, hello world. I can edit. So you can directly edit your code here with a web-based interface. You don't need to use a nano or VI if you're not familiar with those. So this is a very convenient way to get you started. So you go to dashboard, and then there is a file menu here. It's more or less like a content management system, but using this interface, you can manage all the files on your, on Grace and Terra and uh, other systems in the future. So this is what on open on demand. This is one of the most interesting features, and you know, get, uh, get you direct access to your files. You don't need to do SCP and downloading other things. You can also go to the home directory. There are many, you know, directories I have some files I have for testing purpose. Okay, let me go back to the slides and let's see where we are. And uh, so after you log in, you check the NVIDIA SMI. Let me go, uh, I can do that later. So I show you, you know, you can check this with Grass 4 or 5 and that's what you will get you'll get to say NVIDIA and SMI is not fun because we don't have GPUs. These are, those, we, you know, there's no CUDA uh, uh, drivers installed and no NVIDIA utilities installed. So you, don't, you, you won't be able to find this command line because it's only CPU. Okay.
Which one is this? Hello, hello, world device.stu or? Let me just one second. Let me go back to my. So assume you're here on um, one of the on one of our nodes. It's like as it one, two, three, and Nvidia really SMI will tell you, you know, who is running what. Someone is running the server manager. Uh, you know, someone is running it, and it's using almost zero CPU. It's probably not a very efficient GPU application. So what you can do, you can go to Scratch. It's really recommended that you go to C-R-A-T-C-H, your scratch space. You can download the, the code. Let's see, it's, it's here. You can copy and paste, copy this whole thing, go see. And then you can go to the, you can control V. So this will download the uh, examples for you all. Wget. Yeah. So this will be a zipped tar file. And then you can tar zxvf. So this will untar this zipped file. It will create a new folder. You can use a tab key. So currently, if you have CUDA, then use the dot, just tab, which will automatically finish the file name for you. So this will unzip the files into a folder called a CUDA. Then you can CD this directory, CD CUDA, we will change the directory into CUDA. So these are the files under the CUDA directory. Uh, that's the best we can do. This is a very, very small one. Look, you don't have a very bright, but you can follow the, the slides. I'll show you the slides. This, yeah, you can, you can copy and paste the, the, all the command lines from the slides. Can you see, probably can you see it better here? Yeah. Probably just easy to copy and paste from your from the slides. Mm -hmm. You were asking what's the terminal is not available. Right? If you can't see anything, I see. I see. So, have you ever? written any C or C++ code before? C code maybe, probably C++, no, not C++. Yeah, so this is just uh, you know, I, I can just go through this quickly. The first one, I just loaded the module, CUDA, like we did before. Just loaded the libraries, and so the environment knows that particular version that you want to use. Um, and then we see these uh, scratch space and we download the file with a wget and then we unzip the file into directory CUDA and then we go into CUDA directory and then compile this hello world host dot cu. This will just print out hello world on your screen. And if you don't specify the output name, you know, the default output for all this compiler will be a dot out. So the next line is just to run this executable on the system. Dash, you know, uh, dot, backslash, add dot out, or just run this executable. You should be able to get something out. And then the last one is just to submit our job to the backend. So we will be submitting our job to the backend, one of the computing nodes uh, with the GPUs to run our job 
on the node. That's what this last line is about. So the last line is relevant to the queuing system. If you're not familiar with HP answer systems, you need to have to, you'll have to go back to some other you know, short courses to learn how to use this, uh, to use a, a queuing system. You need to create a job file and specify your account information and other things in the file, and then you submit your job. Let me share the, this file one more time, this, you know, this uh, link, just in case some of you didn't get it. It's best if you just copy directly from the, uh, from the slides. Um, where's the link? Oh, here we go. Yes. I have a question about Sark. Mention that this was on JS or Terra, any of these. If I want to load, you know, a few modules, for the number of modules on the batch file, I can just do it in the batch file. I'll skip it. Yes. If I want to work on the login node, but I don't, to, every time I want to use, I don't want to load like 10 different modules. Is there any way I can like script or something? Yes, there is. There is a column. Whenever I try to do that, the script just doesn't execute. Like no, not, not, not a script. You use a user module save to a certain name. You save it to certain name. Next time we just module restore uh, the, a certain name. And then we try to find out something I did previously for another short course. I know it's, it's kind of confusing and it's kind of, uh, you can only use that in script. The script will change the shells. They'll switch to a shell. The shell will not be the same shell used to load the module. So you are, you're not getting anything yeah. from it. Um, let me go back to, you know, this is good to have a small, you know, group here so that I can help you all with small, you know, uh, other things instead of just, uh, so that's one I prepared. Oh, it's not here. It's a it's module store install. Let me search my own uh, file here. So this is what you do. You can do module save, whatever you currently have your environment, whatever you load it up, you save it to a lamp that you're familiar with. So for example, say I, you want to do deep learning. So that's why I say deep learning. The next time when you log in, you just do module restore deep learning. It will restore all the saved module to you. So that's the, these are the things I use myself, but it's really recommended for advanced users. Sometimes you, just, you either get confused if you have multiple restores, you don't do the purge. Make sure you do the module purge for just in case you have some other modules loading in, you know, act by accident. Before, save, mm -hmm. uh, before you save, you know, um, before you load all the modules, make sure you purge them. Before you do this, before you do the restore, you do the module purge. Make sure you, you know, clean up your uh, loaded modules previously. Thank, thank you very much. Yeah. You know, you, you can, I, I can share this for you all and you can also create a file like this for yourself. This will always be useful, you know. Something like that, I, I, I started uh, using this um, uh, Google Drive for a lot of things like this, getting really useful for taking notes and uh, do things. Let me see, where is it? Yeah, this is a Google Doc I used just to create uh, my virtual environment and other things. Um, yeah, this is probably the best combination for creating Python 3.8 best virtual environment for different modules. You, you can try and, you know, if it doesn't work, you switch it to different modules. This is just straightforward.
Okay, let's go back to the slides. And uh, oh, I, I suppose I'll be showing you all the how things are working here. So I'm currently under my CUDA directory and uh, I can just go to hello world and I can do NVCC because, oh, I haven't loaded my module yet. I think I just do the module load CUDA. That's the simplest one. And then if I do ML, you can see CUDA is already loaded. And then I just do NVCC hello world device. It will compile the executable to a dot out. And uh, you can also compile a different file. So, yes. Can you share the link again in the chat? Uh, which link? Okay. The slides? Yeah, I got it. Okay, we are, I, I, I passed it to. Uh, links. The, the previous one is the slide. The last one is uh, the, the document. Google yeah, Google Doc. I already passed it, right? Oh, yeah, you're right. Okay. So that will be helpful for you to work on, you know, deep learning, machine learning projects. You get your Python environment set up. You install your own required versions and you set. See, we haven't really talked about CUDA yet. You know, that's already, but you know, that's the whole point. I really don't think it's a, it's a good way for you to start working on CUDA if you're not familiar with all the basics uh, of the programming and also you can see in C++. If you've never written any C++ code, C code, uh, you'll find it's pretty hard to, uh, to see how CUDA works. But anyway, um, Oh, let me submit a job so then you see how the job submission works as well. That's a very important for you to start using our system. So now I have this, I'll, I'll show you what this looks like. This is just a bunch of files. And if you look at this, those are just, uh, it's not, uh, It probably looks better this way. Not maximized. Okay. So if you look at the the, the uh, okay. so let's, uh, let's look at Grace. Okay. If you are familiar with uh, with the shell script, you know these are just comments except the first line. First line just tells the uh, the shell environment this will be a bash shell. And all these are just comments. And all these are just comments. But if you are run, if you want to submit your job, the S batch will take this as the instructions for you to set parameters. Uh, S batch, oh, those are not so good for in person uh, attendees here. <laughs> it's it's kind of hard to see. But for those on Zoom, I should be able to see this screen easily. Yes. Oh, yeah, okay. I think this one is not on Zoom. Stop sharing. I'll just, I'll probably just share my screen. It'd be easier. Share my screen. Yeah, you can see it on Zoom, probably easier on the, on the, on the, on the, on the wall here. So this is a job script. Double uh, pound sign means it's a comment for the job script. And a single pound sign here means it's, it, it's a S batch uh, option or configuration or parameter, whatever you call it. So all these double pound signs, these are just my comments, just telling you all you know, what I'm, I'm trying to do. And then this one, starting with S batch, these are the ones S batch will take as an input parameter. So you have a job name. This could be something, whatever you can do here, the job name, you know, job example four, and a time, how long you want to run. You really don't, you know, if you just for quick test, you don't want to set a long time because if you need a say two hours, and if our system only have us block empty for a you know, short period of time, then my job will probably get executed faster because you know I just need 30 minutes and the system will, you know, put my job in a queue and get it run faster instead of waiting for two hours 
like waiting for a long period to insert your job in it. Um, and also, if you are just for simple testing, uh, one task will be sufficient. You don't need to run two or three. And uh, you can also go into uh, check out the video, uh, recorded videos for all the uh, jobs, uh, job schedulers that uh, at PLC uh, short courses are covering. Some other short courses are covering that. And also, this will be output for your, uh, this is a name for your output. And you want to, this will be the standard one GPU per job. You can set it two to two because on our GPUs, we do have our GPU nodes, we have two GPUs in it, in each node. You can set this up to two. Uh, but of course, if your job is not able to take off, uh, use, leverage two GPUs, then you're just wasting one GPU. So these are all the options you want. Uh, these are the ones you don't need to set because we'll be using your default account and no email will be sent to you unless you really want to uh, get an email from the scheduler. If you want to run something overnight and you can, you know, you can, you can comment out this, get rid of one of the pound sign and you can, change, you can change this email address to your own email address. Say like here, I want to change this to myself. I'll, get, I'll be getting an email after the job is started or you know, for all the other things that are relevant to the job. So if you don't need it, I just put an extra pound sign to just comment it out. So these are the things I needed to put in, in my script. For example, just imagine when you want to run this on a computer node. The computer node doesn't really know what your environment is. So the very first thing you need to do is you need to load your environment. You need to tell the computing node, which is different from your logging node. We are, submit, we are submitting our job on the login node, right? One of the login nodes. And the computer nodes are just somewhere hidden. Uh, we, 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 are not have, we don't have access to those. You need to tell those computer nodes which environment you want to use. And then uh, how to run those. So this will be considered as, a, as a executables for your application. This could, you could have a long string with all the parameters here, but here I'm just trying to run my edit out application on my current directory. So after I finish editing this file, I can just run it. I'm sorry. I can S batch and then grass. So the job will be submitted to the queue system. If I do the queue stat, the last one will be, oh, here I, I just saw you just submitted a job. And I just submitted one here before you. Uh, if you just do a queue stat, that will show you all the jobs. C will be already probably done, I think. Canceling, it's already finished. And then R is a running, and the Q is a queued. It's, it's still in the queuing system. You know, needed to be, uh, it's all waiting for its turn to be executed. So the output here will be here. If you look at the output file, uh, you can use a cat. This is a simple one. It will catch it up. Oh, we're saying this. It, this one doesn't have. Okay, let me go to uh, hello world because I compiled my code here, so I need I need to run it here. Let's add grass. Okay. Let me see if Okay, my job is running. As you can see, my last job was just submitted. It's running on GPU. And the output is here. So it's hello world. And the reason why the previous one is not working because I was trying to submit here. There's no a.out file here. If I'm using absolute pass of the file, it should be fine. But I don't have any a.out on my current directory. It says you know, there is an error message. Um, saying, you know, the file not found. So it's just telling you it's not in there. Sure, go ahead. So you just did Q stat, right? What is the difference between that and SQ? SQ is with all the jobs, right? Uh, you mean, uh, there are many other options. This is this one I usually use myself. Uh, actually, this is not a, uh, a standard. Uh, I'm not sure, this is not a standard uh, S batch command line. I think it's S info or something. SQ also gives you a list of all the jobs. Uh, SQ, right? U, 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 yeah. Oh, U, U. yeah, this will list all the queues available, I think, or, or your jobs. Let me 
these are, I'm not sure what. Yeah, that's SQ. That's the that's the slurm thing. That's slurm command. Um, I'm not sure what's this Q stand. I use this myself, so I never. So that's a Q stand. It's a standards of standing up. Uh, um, but anyway. That's what I use. It's, it's cleaner interface and it has multiple, you know. I think you execute, you type minus you and the other user name, you just kill it. I see. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I used to use uh, this Q standards on Ada or not. So I, I you know. I, it's already done. I already finished all my job, so I don't have uh, this. Thank you. Uh, let's go back to the slides. So, you know, that's the, I think we have enough time for today. So I all down with some simple tests there on the machine. At least you get your job running. That's, that's a very big step forward. Um, you can run CUDA jobs. That's very good. You are using our big GPUs, another plus. And uh, you are using 40 gig of memory on GPUs. Think about some problem. You can you can make full use, use of the 40 gig of memory, GPU memory, which is uh, um, kind of important to something to think about in the future. Okay, uh, let's start getting to the, the real thing about CUDA. So CUDA used to be meaning, you know, compute unified device architecture, but now CUDA is just CUDA. Just like a TAMU, right? Uh, really is called the Texas Agriculture and the Mechanical, uh, I'm sorry, Mechanic Universities, but it's just TAMU now. No one really go back to figure out what's the detailed meaning for each letter. But CUDA here, just CUDA. You know, in the future, you don't need to worry about the, the meaning for those. It's a, it's a very general purpose uh, GPU programming framework. And uh, it's getting really, really popular, not only in the scientific computing community, people doing visualization, all the rendering stuff, they're using CUDA as well. It's, you know, even though a lot of people are still using OpenGL and all those libraries, but CUDA is, it's kind of like ramping things up around those libraries. And it's itself is, is kind of general purpose. So you can do a lot of things that OpenGL cannot do. And, and uh, it's, it's kind of getting interesting to see, you know, not only scientists and engineers are using CUDA, but also um, people doing visualizations, uh, technical visualization are using CUDA as well. And it retains performance in a sense for the CUDA, CUDA, CUDA code, you written, uh, you write, you wrote, I'm sorry, you wrote for some old CUDA devices, could be part of uh, performance portable to some other uh, newer version devices. This is not always true, uh, but in most cases, it's, it's a valid statement. Um, I know, you know, for different versions of uh, CUDA architecture, for different GPUs like Tesla, Maxwell, Kepler, all those different versions, they are changing the hardware, uh, you know, once in a while. They sometimes they'll add some extra, you know, uh, memory. Sometimes like an extra cores, and you needed to modify your code sometime uh, uh, just to just get the performance um, benefit with the new hardware. And um, and the CUDA C and C++ here is just a standard CUDA you know, implementation is based on the industry standard C and C++. If you are not a C or C++ programmer, you might find it hard to grasp CUDA you know, at the first glance, but it's, after you tried it a couple of times, C and C++ is not that hard. It's just C, it's getting complicated when you're dealing with all the memory blocks, doing with uh, pointers and, you know, Pointers to arrays, arrays to pointers, and all those kind of things getting nested, you're getting complicated. But the basic structure of C is pretty clean, and uh, C++ is a different story. You know, it, it has an uh, object-oriented programming style, and it could be very complicated depending on how you define your classes, etc. And the CUDA extension is very, very small, actually. If you look at what CUDA is doing with CUDA, and also standard C and C++, the difference is not that big. And we all talk about some differences uh, uh, just in the next several slides. And it's just a small extension. Um, and also the APIs used for CUDA to call those you know, lower level 
um, functionalities and CUDA, is, CUDA architecture is pro programming. Those are very straightforward APIs. And uh, they have been working hard to simplify the user interface, like make the APIs easy to use and then make the performance better just by modifying the runtime libraries uh, from the CUDA side and video side. So CUDA started as an OpenGL API. Again, you know, uh, GPUs were just used mostly for graphical uh, stuff. And uh, OpenGL is open graphical language, I believe. Uh, that's API used for programming. Uh, you know, a lot if you are if you are a gamer, right? You needed to uh, be pretty familiar with OpenGL library. Because once in a while, the, you know, some new games will require new libraries you need to install those and keep those up. But I think in uh, 2000, early 2000, 2005, 2006, a, a lot of groups, uh, a lot of research groups are starting using OpenGL to do simulations. They are using OpenGL to run uh, fluid dynamic simulations back then. And uh, in 2017, NVIDIA released the first generation of test on GPUs and supporting uh, CUDA. And uh, I believe I was involved in a project starting working on the CUDA best code best uh, application in 2008, I believe. That's when we first got the Tesla card donated from NVIDIA. And uh, it's very expensive back then. It's, it's probably $20,000 just per card. And now, uh, well, it's, it's about the same price, but you're getting, getting much, much better GPU nowadays, right? After more than 10 years. And uh, the current step of version of CUDA is 11.5. Uh, as of this month, and um, it's it has a multi layers of multiple multiple layers of um, uh, libraries inside, and we we'll, we will go into a bit more details about those. So, the terminology for CUDA. If you talk about a CUDA architecture, there are two things you need to keep in your mind. Two very important uh, uh, concepts. One is called the host. Another one is the device. So for the host, we are mostly referring to CPU and the memory about the, the, the node itself, the traditional computer. And the GPU here refers to the device, uh, I'm sorry, the device here refers to the GPU and its memory. So the GPU memory, here we're talking about 40 gig memory, it's a device side memory. And the host has its own memory, that's the main memory, which is 380 gigabytes of memory on Grace. So, Talking about heterogeneous computing, we, the, the idea is basically there are part of a code. Part of our codes are good for, for parallelization on GPUs. And part of our code are good for handling with CPUs. So heterogeneous here just means you hybrid all different methodology paradigms together with both CPUs and GPUs to deal with your code. In your code, you have a theory code that are dealing with input and output and dealing with internalization, dealing with you know various uh, some business logic that cannot be disputed. That's where the, the CPU is good at. If you have a lot of if conditions, you know, branches, the CPU can, very, can, can do that very efficiently. But the GPUs are not very good at branching and doing all the prediction, et cetera. And the CPU have been optimized and, and designed to handle those you know, complex, complex uh, business logics. Uh, that's what a GPU, a CPU has, has been designed for. Now, if you have a bunch of, you know, parallel code, which you can easily cut your data into pieces and let each core or each, you know, each thread to handle each piece, then using GPU will definitely, definitely be beneficial because GPUs has so many, you know, much more uh, cores, uh, simpler cores than CPU cores can handle all the things very, very efficiently. Um, you know, that's depending on how, how much performance you want to gain from the GPU. That's actually the most complicated part. And, and the GPU programming, CUDA programming, give you access to even to the cache memory. So that means you have control of about what data you want to put in the cache you want to deal with. But the CPUs don't. You only just say, okay, I want to de declare a register in a variable, and this will be probably put in the register, will be definitely faster. And, and you, you don't have any control about the cache usage for your C and you know, Fortran program. You just declare your variables and the 
compiler will handle that for you. It will decide what kind of which part of data needed to be put in the cache for fast reaccess. It decides when the data needed to be you know copied to the main memory. It's it's not your you know uh, choice. Uh, copying data back and forth uh, to and from the cache is done by a compiler for CPUs. But for GPUs, you have the fine control of all the tiny details, it give you access to the lower level hardware access. But um, you know, also depending on the level of the performance you want to achieve, you really want to achieve extremely high performance. It's, it's just like writing assembly code there. You have a detailed, detailed control, but then you have to do a lot of work. So it's completely up to you to decide if you want to do that. So CUDA does provide some simple ways for you to deal with all those different kind of allocation of you know, memories. They have the ping the memory functions and all the other things can help you with that. But if you really want to have a control of how to assign tasks and when and where to copy the data, you do have the control to do that. So that's one of the major dif difference between the CPU and GPU. And GPU gives the access um, to the hardware, you know, internal hardware to you. Um, yeah, that's a good question. So that's something I think if you really want to, uh, you know, get the most benefit out from GPUs, uh, that's the most uh, complicated part. You need to spend time into, uh, spend time on those uh, parts. So this. Uh, diagram shows the basic workflow uh, to get the, the the code working. So you started with. Let me go back here. Yeah, go ahead. A lot of scientific code that mostly latency bound or bandwidth bound rather than compute bound. Like the like CPU can give you the peak performance may be very high, but the latency or uh, bandwidth you may have issues. So the GPUs uh, like, do we is that like. Can we categorically say that, okay, for these kind of problems, we'll, uh, GPUs, for example, uh, for latency bond problems, is it better to run on a GPU because of how the memory is distributed or something? Yeah, the question is about, you know, different uh, problem type, different problems, scientific applications you have, either, you know, computer intensive or you know, uh, the data intensive. Um, for data intensive uh, problems, the transfer and also the latency, the bandwidth, the bus bandwidth when you transfer data uh, between processors and you know, between different components or your computing units, um, that, that's the bandwidth and also latency. All this involved into your uh, give you the the extra delay when you when you, when you have a lot of data transfer. Um, for computer intensive applications, it will be uh, ideal for GPUs because if you can divide your data into uh, your, your compute computation into smaller tasks. GPUs has much more cores for you to finish all those computing tasks at you know quickly because you just have so many computing power, raw computing power. But now there is a the question about there is a balance about uh, you know when you whenever you want to do anything on GPUs, you need to copy the data to GPU, and then after you get a, a computation down, you need to copy the data back to CPU for other things you want to process. So this transfer to and from the GPU is the overhead you want to consider. If it's a computer intensive, and if your computation takes a big chunk of your time, if you, if you can saturate your GPU you know, with all your compu computation you need to do, this time taken, this overhead for transferring data back and forth will be negligible. And by in this case, it will be ideal for GPU best application. You can you probably can feel safe then to say that it's uh, it's a good it's it's a probably a beneficial to port my code to GPU. But in some other cases, if you have so many you know conditional branches, if you don't have a lot of data, if you have you don't have a lot of computation to do, but you have a lot of data to process, transferring to GPU and back will actually make your code slower. So for those kind of applications, you definitely don't want to use a GPU. And actually in real business world, uh, unless that dramatically changes the way how they handle their business logic, a lot of things currently handled with CPUs cannot be easily ported to C uh, GPUs, mainly because you know, a lot of them requires a lot of uh, conditional statement that need uh, to, to uh, 
to tell a lot of, you know, that they needed to predict a lot of branches to optimize the performance. If you copy the data to the GPU, make some computation, and then go back to CPU to make some prediction, and then go back to CPU, uh, CPU again, this will definitely slow down your application. And, the, and uh, again, GPUs are very, very, those computing cores are very simple. They don't have a long, uh, how to call the, the queue pipelines, the instruction pipelines for you to do the so-called branch prediction. You can benefit the branch, uh, branch prediction in CPUs because CPUs have a pretty long pipeline of instructions. And then you can, before you run your particular you know, task, you can try to predict which branch will be more likely to happen with the CPU. That's the beauty of this complex instruction sets. Uh, but on GPUs, the, instru the, data, the instruction cache and the data cache are much, much smaller because they have so many cores. Each core needed to have a small little bit of instruction set or each uh, swamp, or each, uh, I'm sorry, each ramp. I'm sorry, it's a, what's the name? It's a, uh, a very small unit uh, there that can have multiple cores inside. We'll be sharing all these instruction sets, which is very, very small. And if it's that small uh, instruction uh, cache size, such optimization strategies is not doable. So that's the reason why, you know, uh, a lot of people, they are not so keen on using GPUs, mainly because their tasks have, haven't been reformatted to fit into GPU. And of course, if you really do hard, uh, you know, if you think hard enough, many problems could be mapped into the way some GPU can handle, but that's another, another level of extra work you need to do. It's not just simply coding. They cannot just hire someone just to pause the code to see GPU. They have to rethink their problem to do that. Again, that's a very good question. You know, that's something you need to think about before you work on CUDA code, you know, using libraries give you some boost will be easy to do for this kind of problem. If your problem could be decomposed into, uh, you know, uh, those kind of structures. Uh, computer intensive kernel, uh, you know, plus some uh, business logics. And those kind of applications could be easily separated, uh, could decomposed into parts and you can benefit both CPUs and GPUs. The numerical com uh, computer intensive part could be ported into, uh, you know, offload. Uh, could be offloaded. I'm sorry. Could be offloaded to GPUs, and your CPU will handle the main logic. And that's actually the the structure of most of most of most of uh, GPU accelerated applications nowadays. So this diagram shows you first you copy data and your program to the main memory on GPU, and then you after I think uh, then you load the GPU program. And then you call the data, uh, you, you, you copy the data directly into the, the, you know, the internal memory, the shared memory, and then do the computation inside the C, uh, GPU. And after you're done, you copy all the data back to CPU. Of course, now that's with newer technologies, so the GPU direct and all the remote memory access, et cetera, uh, since it will be, could it be uh, simplified. You don't need to do this copying. So GPUs can directly have access to your memory. You don't need to copy it back from your CPUs. Uh, you can directly access to the main memory. Um, and also one GPU on one node can directly vis visit the memory, uh, the data in the memory in another node. I mean, the GPU memory. You don't need to go through the CPU to get access to the uh, GPU in another node, but those will require some special programming. Um, there are also special hardware required. For, for example, the Fidi band network is necessary for you to do this. and. Uh, uh, usually those are not available for regular you know, computers. On our systems, we do have this supported, but it's just too much effort to just get the program done. Unless you are you have a pretty big project supporting you to do this. Otherwise, a lot of people they just don't have the resources and uh, manpower to do the coding for them to take advantage of this GPU direct uh, uh, you know, uh, technology. But for traditional and standard GPU applications, this is basically the workflow. You copy the data to the GPU, get it done, copy it back. And that, that's mostly the, the, the high level overview about how things work. Starting in 2.6.0, um, there is so-called a unified memory. These are just virtual memories. They are trying to unify the CPU and GPU memory as a one virtual memory block for you. Um, but before 2016, 
there was no hardware support for this kind of mechanism. So the company is still down, you know, using software internally, but users just don't see it. And the performance is not so good. It's just simplifies the way how you write your code, but you know, when you think about performance, you won't be able to gain much with a unified memory. But starting with 2016, in 2016 with the Pascal uh, GPU, there will be some hardware support to support the caching between the CPU and GPU memory, which is hidden from users, but there will be some caching mechanism. Like easier, if you have a, some data that could be reused, you don't need to go directly to a CPU memory to grab data again, it can directly get from data from the cached uh, uh, the memory block. That will be much faster for GPU memory to have access to. So that's the, uh, the, two, the unified memory. And uh, the, you know, in, in, in addition to malloc, you know, that's, that's when you write, write your C program into malloc, the dynamically malloc allocate your memory called malloc. Malloc is a function standard library in, in C uh, for a programmer to dynamically manage the system's memory usage. Um, and a CUDA malloc is something similar compared to C, but it's, you can use a CUDA malloc to allocate memory on GPUs to reserve block of memory for you to copy data from your CPU. And after you've you are done with your calculation. You can copy the data back to CPU and then free your memory on the GPU. So the unified memory can do this for both you know, uh, CPUs and GPUs. You don't need to worry about copying data and force, back and force. All you need to do is just do a synchronization and that's it. So this is a, a very simple, I just mentioned, uh, we, we tried it. Uh, this is a standard C uh, hello world. If you never, you know, wrote any C uh, code, for C, you always need a main function as your entry point for your program. And then you can call other libraries or other functions. And a printf is one of the standard libraries that C is providing as, you know, distributed with, uh, with their runtime. Um, it's all be, uh, printf is so-called a formatted print. You have, you can add in all the uh, format string and to decide how you want to format your output. Um, finally, after you're done, you can return uh, a value there. Zero here usually representing success. If you have a non-zero value, uh, the system might detect it as a, you know, some error might be happening. Uh, you can have some error catching, but a zero return usually re uh, representing uh, a successful return. So that's a very simple hello world for C and you know, C++, it's, it looks similar, but you are using different uh, syntax for output, et cetera. There are different libraries, streaming art libraries for output, but uh, this is a C uh, code anyway. So you can compile C with NVIDIA C compiler, and then you can, you can rename this .c file into .cu file. You can, you can pretend this to be a CUDA file, and it's, it's, a, it's a legit CUDA file, and it's a legit CUDA program anyway. And after you run it, your, uh, your, uh, you'll get the output from this C code. So here we are just using the NVIDIA compiler and the C compiler, and nothing more, nothing less than that. Now, uh, we'll we'll be adding one more function. We call this a device code. So this device code will be running on the device. Here, do you remember host the device? Host referring to the CPU and the main memory. Device refers to the GPU and the GPU memory. So if you have a global keyword, these are the so-called you know, syntax sugar, more or less like you've already have something already defined. You just add some keywords and give yourself some extra you know, uh, uh, domain of, uh, of control here. This underscore, underscore global, underscore, underscore. This gives the CUDA compiler some indication about what this function is about. So with a global, this means this is a device function that can call the, from the host. So when you write a code, you need to be clear what kind of function you're writing. You're writing a function for the host, or are you writing for a function for the device? This underscore underscore global here indicating it's it's a device function. It's callable by the host. As you can imagine, you can have underscore underscore device. It will be a device function callable from the device. Okay, so it's always you know like a yin and a yang, right? you have a device and a host. These two are just interacting and you just need to figure out uh, the right function to write. 
So we define this, this dummy function, there's nothing in it. But now if, if we want to call this function, uh, there will be an interesting syntax here as well. We use a so-called triple angle uh, bracket uh, to include two uh, numerical values here. Let's don't worry about it. Let's just consider this as just a, like a call for the kernel that we want to run uh, on the GPU. So if you like look at, at this main function, this main function just same as previous ones. It's just and inserted one more line called my kernel. And my kernel is just a device function that's callable by, by this host function main. And this function will be executed on the device. That's how you offload your stuff. You can imagine this function could be inserted anywhere in your code. If you uh, identify some hotspot in your code, you take that chunk of code out, replace that with a device function and then call it, you're already doing the offloading. That's how you do it. But now you may ask, how can I decide which core I want to run and how many core I want to use? And those are exactly decided by the numbers here in between this triple angular brackets, angle brackets. Um, and I will talk more about those two numbers. So I already talked about this underscore underscore global. And that's the, one of the major difference between the C uh, and the CUDA. One of the major difference, this is a extra indicator or decorator, whatever you call it, probably, it's probably a decorator might not be a good way, it's probably indicator. Um, it's just a keyword to tell the CUDA compiler that this one has some special meaning. It's not a traditional or standard C um, uh, function. So LMC's NVIDIA compiler will separate the source code into the host and the device components. So for on the host device, uh, for the host component, uh, uh, component, it will just use a standard, you know, host compiler to compile it. Either it could be, it could be using uh, Intel compiler, it could be using a GNU compiler to compile the host code, just like a traditional C and C++ code. But the device code will be compiled by itself because it will need all the detailed implementation in CUDA library and CUDA runtime to do that. That's priority, and NVIDIA hasn't really re, you know, open source that yet. Everyone can download it, uh, you know, it's free, but uh, it's not open source. Um, so that's why there are a lot of discussions about the, the support of the uh, Linux community by the NVIDIA, and also there are a lot of interactions between the NVIDIA and also open source communities in the last many years. Uh, one of the major issues is about the, the way how the driver, the drivers is uh, wrapped and uh, how close these controls, the parameters are, etc. So uh, for the main function, you can compile it with all the you know standard, but all the my kernel will be processed by NVIDIA compiler. That's their old stuff. Okay, this triple angle, triple angle brackets, it's a it's a call uh, from the host to the device code. It will be, it's, it's also called a kernel launch. When you launch a kernel, you just call this function. And then you open CL, uh, the kernel launch is kind of different. You, you get a string of your kernel code. And the kernel launch will be take your string and compile your string of code. So your whole function will be wrapped up into a string, single string, uh, just like a regular Python string. It will take your string as your source code and compile it and launch it uh, using the open cell. Yes. So this is uh, this needs to be done for every piece of code that we would want to be uh, processed separately. Right? For every piece of code that you want to process on your on the on the, on the device. Right. Yeah, we have to put that in. The you have to do this yourself for every kernel. Okay. And then the, the address will be different. Only one one anymore. Yeah, definitely. The depending on if this. You, if if, if they, are, they have dependencies, sometimes you have dependencies, right? This one have to run behind this one. So you probably have some, uh, when you launch the kernels, then maybe you, you, you can wait until the first one done, then you launch the second one. Sometimes you can launch this all together. This is called a synchronous and synchronous kernel launching. But then if, if we have a certain flow of, uh, I mean, an order in which we want our functions to be called, uh, then how are we saving our time? Because we are not, Finally. Yeah, but for each kernel, it will be parallelized anyway, because inside you need to run all the CPU, all the GPU cores, use all of them to speed up your code. 
and you're not doing a single because the first one if is the first one is very computer intensive, which are already taking up all your cores anyway. You're not wasting any wasting any hardware resources. But if your first one is just using a small chunk of code, and the second one could be run second kernel at the bottom of your code might be executed at the same time if they don't depend on each other, it will be more efficient to run them all together. So one kernel will be using say 1,000 cores, another one will be using another 1,000 cores. And you can do all this all together. So that's called a synchronous uh, kernel launching. That only possible means you don't have any dependencies. And uh, we'll talk about the primary in a second. And that's it. That's how you launch a kernel. You know, you define a kernel as a callable from the host. You use this triple angular brackets. And with you know one one, just get started. And you can, we can talk about that in a second. Just run this function, and that's it. So this is a, you know this kernel does nothing, and it's the way how we compile it, how we run it, it's the same. Nothing changed. Now let's talk about something more interesting. So if we want to do the, the, the most important thing, we want to use a CUDA to do it, to do something for us because CUDA have multiple cores. And we want those cores to work for us. We don't want to just use one single core and then leave all the others empty and doing nothing. That's a big waste of time. Actually, if you just want to do this, CPUs will be much more fast, much faster than and GPUs if you're just using one core, right? Because first, the CPU calls usually run at a much higher frequency. You know, frequency is a the square root of frequency is, is a proportional to the heat created in a, in a, in a core. So that's why uh, for GPUs, they cannot go to very, very high frequency because for each core, if you run at a very high frequency, it will produce a tons and tons of heat because it has so many cores for C, uh, GPUs. But for CPUs, it has a relatively less number of cores and it has a higher frequency for each uh, CPU to uh, CPU core to run. So usually CPU cores also, it has a complex instruction. It's, it's much more efficient than dealing with uh, you know, regular series code. And um, if you're just running on single core, it's always, a bit, it's always good to run it on CPU, traditional CPU, not on GPUs or others. Um, now, if you have this very simple example, for example, the vector addition. So vector could be, you know, you can consider vector like, uh, um, when you do the vector addition, you do this element by element. It's not like a vector, you know, multiplic oh no, matrix multiplication. You need to consider columns and rows, et cetera. You need to do that. But for vector, vector, every column, um, I'm sorry, every row, every column or every row, every row could be done independently. A plus B could be simply with A1 plus B1 and A2 plus B2, et cetera. They could be done independently. So this will be ideal for GPU to deal with. You just need to assign A1 plus B1 equals C1 to one core, GPU core, and do the rest like that. For each core of the GPU, we can do all this just with one instruction cycle. And this could be done all together. With just one instruction cycle, this could be done. But if you do this in sequential, it will be linearly proportional, the time will be linearly proportional to the size of the matrix, uh, the vector, right? So that's how you do the parallel program. You, you want every part to be done independently so that can, they can be done all together. So uh, a very simple kernel here, we, we want to just add two integers. This is a very simple kernel. If you look at the kernel here, let's just try to add A and B into C, and that's it. A and B are pointers to two integers, and C is a pointer to the, to the address we're holding the, um, the memory address holding the, um, the, 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 the sum of A and B, okay? So we define this as a global because we want this function to be running on GPUs and we want to call this from CPU. And um, it's, you know, we needed to allocate memory for the, for the GPU because that's something you know we needed to to do. So then that goes into memory management. We are, we are not, you know, I'm just telling you piece by piece. That was just for addition for 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 the calculation. But for memory management, it's it's a, like a different uh, uh, branch of story here. In C, if you want to allocate memory, 
um, you just need to malloc, mal M -A -L -K, memory allocate, malloc, and then you free and you reallocate and do other things with a, with a memory, uh, main memory. But if you want to allocate memory on GPUs, it will be a little bit different. You need to know exactly when you allocate memory, you want to know if this memory is a pointer to the memory and it should be saved on the host, or it could be a host memory. You want to copy, have a point or pointer saved somewhere else. So you need to, you need also need to know the uh, the you know the direction where this memory could be copied to and from. So I'll show you one example here. So it'll probably be easier for you to see the. Let's just go back to the addition. This is nothing wrong, but here, uh, you know, it's the same uh, ending function. But here, let's look at this uh, malloc function here. So malloc will allocate this memory uh, for from a vector on the on the on the GPU device on the GPU, and the size here is just size or integer. Uh, it's just one single vector or one single, you know. Uh, in integer. So this will just do a one simple integer, uh, you know, addition on the GPU. If you want to do this on CPU with uh, alloc, you can directly do the alloc and do the same thing. But here we are just using CUDA and malloc allocated memory. So the next thing we need to do, we need to copy the memory from the data we have on the CPU to GPU. That's a CUDA mem copy, that's a function. So we use the same function, but we use a different indicators here. If you want to copy the data from the host to device, you need to have an indicator, this, which here looks complicated, but this is just one symbol. That's just one integer indicating which direction you're copying. If it's probably one, it will be copying from host to device. If it's zero, from copy device host. But if we just have a long string to, to make it easy for us to see what's, what's going on there. That's just a flank, you know, uh, when you call a function like this. And then you launch your function. And it will, this and function, because it's uh, running on this GPU, it can only take the memory from the GPU. So this is a DA is a device memory for A, DB is a device memory for B. You cannot use a, a host memory, you'll get an error message because it doesn't have access to those memory address. It's only accessible by the device function, the global function we defined previously, and a function. And the, the output of this will be saved into the device memory C. After it's done, the memories, the device memory at C will be, the device memory for C will be updated. And then you copy the device memory, the, the data from the device memory C to the C memory inside of your main memory. C is here the pointer, pointing to the main memory. So that's also, if you look at the flag at the, bottom, at the end of this uh, statement, it says memory copy device to host. It will copy the device to host. But we are still using, we are still using the same uh, function. But this flag is a flip when you copy the data back to CPU. And then you do the CUDA free, it will free the memory on the device for ABC and then return zero. That's indicating a successful you know, uh, uh, function call. So let's go back one more time. So we first we initialize ABC. Those are the three ABC are three numbers. And we are, we are, are going to analyze them. Here we give them A equals to two, B equals to seven at the bottom of this. But DA, DB, DC, those are pointers pointing to the memory on the device. And then we allocate memory for them on the device. And then we call the device function, the global function to calculate the sum of A and B, and then we copy the results back to the main memory where C is. Then we free ABC, we can print out C if you want, but here we, I didn't print out C, but in your code, you can print out C to see the results. So does it make sense? Sure. You know, my can copy all those are being done by the host. Those are all done in the code. This is a host runtime memory, runtime APIs that the CUDA library is providing. Those are all the host functions. These are CUDA functions. When you install CUDA, this will be there in your CUDA library. So you need to run them three times around your uh, program? Or are these just initializing? No, every time, whenever you want to get the data back from the 
uh, from the device, you need to copy, do a mem copy. So it's, you need, probably need to call this many times. If your code needed to do this, you know, to, to, to offload, you know, if you want to evolve, say, the temperature in this room, you know, after every time step, you need to copy that back to and from many, many times, so not just once. So, for example, if I created the memory once, I'm using uh, Mac yeah. and then copy. And then I run some function on that and we changed in the GPU. Then I don't bring it back to the host and then I do something else in the host. And then I go back and then I take some inputs from the host and then just one small change and then I have to do some computation in the... So will the memory be retained or once the operation is done, will the device get rid of the memory? Yes, yes. I, I see exactly what you're saying here. When you do the malloc, you just do the malloc once, usually. After you allocate a memory, it's already there. You don't need to allocate it again, unless you free them. It's like a parenthesis. You have a left one, you have a right one. Malloc is a left parenthesis. F, uh, a free is a right parenthesis. After left and right, you get to this, you have a whole pair. So that's always a good practice. When you write a malloc, make sure you always write a free. So when you, then you can insert whatever in between. So after you get a memory allocated, as long as you don't free them, you can always use them. And you can copy back many times. There's no reason, you know, those, those data got lost because they will be stored in the GPU memory for you. Um, and, but the problem is you need to do this memory copy many times because sometimes when the data is updated on your host, if you, for example, if you divide your main, uh, main computational domain into many, many pieces and each node, I'm not talking about each GPU, each node has a small piece. And then you need the, the communication between the nodes, right? In the MPI or even some other, you know, uh, communication message passing, uh, you know, program interface. But every time we synchronize this, you also need to copy this data back to your C GPU. Your GPU needed to copy data back to you. You need to do synchronization at multiple levels. That's the time you need to do many, many levels of communication or uh, com memory copy. But if you just do a very simple single core or single GPU simulation, you can just let the GPU do all the stuff internally. You don't need to copy all the data back every once in a while because you don't need it. So you can store all the data, say like every three time steps. You just need to copy data back for you to output. Yeah, once in a while you need to output. Otherwise, you know, your, your memory can only hold up to three or five time levels, for example. And it's only just every time, every you know, 10 iterations, you output it to your CPU, you, you save it to your IO, save your file. To where? Sorry, it's a, it's a Siri. For some reason, it's thought I'm trying to look for a direction. No, 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 I'm not. Where would you like to go? <laughs> yes. anyway. um, so that's the, uh, the mem copy. So it's, it's very, very uh, tedious if you want to do it manually, but, but if after you think all the logic through, it's, it's not that hard to think about it because you just need to use the GPU as a calculator, more or less. Like you have some business to do on your CPU. Just focus on your business logic. Whenever you want someone to help you with the particular calculations, just offload through it way to uh, GPU. And you just sit here, wait. Until GPU is done, you copy the data. I think the whole logic here is pretty clear. It's just like, make sure you, you separate the variables from your main memory and the device memory. You, know, you, you, you need to keep two set of variables to make sure, yeah. So uh, what would be the, so now we've added two numbers using this. Yes. And, and we can also add two numbers regularly like without any of these. Yes. Uh, what would be the difference in uh, the execution time? Um, the execution time will be the regular execution time plus the time taken to copy data back force. Yeah. So using GPU, just any two numbers, you will be investing your time and you'll be investing extra resources. You'll be contributing to the greenhouse and you're doing a lot of bad things if you just add two numbers. But now that's exactly what our next example is. You need to move to parallel. And when you move to parallel, uh, you'll be doing not just one, any two numbers. You'll be adding like millions of numbers just once with one cycle. That will be much more efficient. But of course, if you just do it once, because currently CPUs are also very fast, uh, you might not be getting much benefit because the time taken to copy will be much, much more than can just doing a very simple calculation like this addition, et cetera. If you do a lot of calculations there, uh, the computation will take you know uh, hours. Then this time taken to copy data by force will be like this, 
negligible. And uh, that's how you can saturate your GPU computation so that you can, you can, you can forget about your overhead for copying data back and forth. Otherwise, this part will be a big chunk of the time. You might, might be just you know, wasting your time, you know, moving, porting your code to GP. So let's move to the next part, just moving to parallel. That's exactly one of the numbers here. I'll tell you what these numbers are. Just don't worry about it. Let's just say, if we want to launch our kernel on N uh, cores, N will be corresponding to number of you know, elements you have for your metrics, for your vectors. And then basically I want each vector of each core on my GPU to calculate one addition for me. So that will be element wise addition. Um, so this is a tricky part. That's the part I, a lot of people got lost. Um, when, you know, I have been teaching this many, many years, four or five years maybe already. Um, so this is the most tricky part. So in CUDA, they have some building, uh, and there's a lot of keywords, there's a structures, like blocks ID. This block ID will be helping you to um, label your local indices. For example, here, you have this addition. And uh, if you give me A and B and a C, this function just care about its local index. Whatever local index assigned to me, I'll deal with those. So this block I, uh, index dot X, block index dot Y, block index, I'm oh, sorry, this X, all, all X is fine. Block index dot X is the value that corresponding to my particular physical core. Does it make sense? So if you give your A is going from one to 10 and you send this to a GPU and if you, if you uh, for a GPU, if you divide this into 10 cores and each core has its own black, uh, blocks ID. And this block ID X will be referring to the, the particular core or a particular thread is handling this. So the core knows exactly which element it's, it's dealing with. So it's not touching all the other elements. It's just because it's using block I, uh, index dot X to refer to the particular element that the core is assigned to. So what you need to do is you need to have a very good mapping from your element index to the hardware index that each uh, core is, uh, is assigned to in the hardware. Yeah. So if our vector is longer than R, number of cores in the GPU, then obviously it should show up. Yes, that's why, that's, that's the next step. When you go to, instead of just N1, you could N, M. And this give you a, a much bigger, uh, a much longer index than you can deal with. If you used to go beyond that, you can divide that. You can, you can have multiple kernels. One kernel, you're doing this, another kernel will wait until the first one is down, the second one is, is up. So N is like the number of operations. Here's what I found. Core. So the second one, the second number. Second one is small, you know, it, actually the first, the second one is the number of threads per block. The first one is the number of blocks. Now we're using these blocks mainly because these blocks is almost unlimited. It's a huge, this number. You can, you can go like billions for this, this, this first number. But second number here is limited. There is an upper limit of about 1000 threads per block. So we'll go into details uh, about that one. But that's why we're using the first one, even though the second one might be more lower level for thread level. The first one is a block. One block can have multiple threads. You can have many, many blocks. Think about this second one like X and the first one like Y. And you, you, you are building up this 3, 2D you know, X, Y um, matrix about your, your, your threads. More or less like in a, in a 2D you look at, if you lay out your, your course in a 2D domain, right? You have X and Ys. Uh, for each uh, core in your, in your hardware layout, you have a coordinate for each core, building coordinate. Because for a given GPU, the hardware is already fixed. There's no way you can change the hardware. And each hardware, each, each core has its index, internal index, building index. And the CUDA knows exactly what index is corresponding to each core. And then when you're trying to launch your kernel with certain numbers, it will assign your 
particular task to the particular core correspondingly. That's exactly what is controlled by this uh, so total number of uh, cores you want to use uh, and the total number of uh, blocks you want to use is controlled by these two numbers here. Let's go into some example. You'll see what I'm talking about. It's, I know it's. Uh, so the, the the block itself is like a virtual kind of concept. It's just trying to divide your your your, your threads. You know, each thread could be corresponding to each core. That's that's basically the concept. One thread, one core. That's what usually people use. You can have model, but usually it's one thread, one core. It's corresponding to each other. It's interchangeable in a sense. Now, one block contains multiple threads, and uh, it can contain multiple cores. One block. That's a that's a it's a virtual concept. Block itself, there's no physical blocks there. Block is a virtual concept, but a core itself is a hardware concept, corresponding to one bread or one thread when you're uh, from the software sense. But a block itself is you can you can you can have many many blocks. How many defined depending on the hardware, depending on what the system is providing. So then there's also the X, Y, and Z, right? The block idea. Yes, inside each block you have X, Y, but we are just using one dimension. You can have like three dimension inside the block. Block could be three D. Uh, how does that come? Right? So one block is made up of let's say thousand threads. So if you can think of a thousand cores together as one block. Uh, yeah, you can see the one thousand cores as as one you know one D array, okay. or one thousand uh, block uh, one thousand uh, cores as a two D matrix inside the block, or could it be three D depending if I use X and Y Z. It's more or less like if you are flattened, we are trying to do the uh, deep learning, right? You have an image. You want to flatten that into 1D array. You can reshape it in 2D. You know, you can even change that to 3D when you reshape your your arrays. The same idea here. You just have 1,000 images. Uh, I'm sorry, 1,000 threads. You can reshape that into a 10 by 10 by 10 block, or could it be reshaped that into 1,000 uh, long array if you're just using the one dimension X. Here. So. Um, so when we put n one, that means for each block, so we're using n blocks, and for each block, one thread. Yes, we are using n blocks and one thread, one each block in each block. All other so the threads are idle. Yeah. So the, the cores. I'm sorry. The other cores in each block are all idle, right? Idle. So it will be one thread per call, and actually, each block will actually will be occupying probably neighboring core one by one. So it's, it's arranged by the CUDA runtime. So block itself is like a virtualized concept. There's no physical meaning attached to block itself. But a thread itself and a core, they are corresponding to the hardware. So when we write dot x, it's the one axis. And if we write dot y, it could be in the other axis. Is that what it means? Um, also, the, you mean the x and y here, right? Yeah, yeah. At x and y, those are also constructed. If you are, it's give you a, a easy mapping to when you're writing this uh, um, a code you're dealing with a three dimension. This will give you a direct reference to the three D dimension yeah. x, y, and z. Right. So here we are saying that a is also in x and b is also in x. That's what we're yes, exactly. If you are dealing with one, just you will be consistent. You need to be consistent. Otherwise, your code itself will be messed up anyway. You want to be consistent that every element uh, in C, say index. Uh, I, C, I, need to always be equal to A, I plus B, I, instead of A, I plus B, J, because that will mess your code up, unless your code is supposed to be doing that. But for the element-wise calculation, your index needed to be matching. Okay, that's for you do the element-wise calculation. This will not messing around with your element. And another thing to consider, if you want to do, say, C blocks index X equal to A block index X minus one or B. This will messing up with your structure. This will not be, you don't have some dependency with a neighboring uh, you know, point. That will not be good because your neighboring might be updated. For example, if I have another statement here, say A blocks X equals something, you cannot, you cannot do this you know, across multiple nodes because uh, that, that will be changing the dependency for your, for your neighbors. And that's not an independent. You cannot do this completely independent like what you are doing here. So that's a tricky part. When you have any dependency, you want to make sure you run your code in a certain way that the dependencies could be automatically resolved. Otherwise, 
each call will have to wait until other calls finish, then you're not getting any benefits about this parallel execution. Okay, so this might be a very simple uh, diagram to show you how that works. So you have multiple blocks, four blocks. Each block here is just probably just one, one core, uh, one core, and each one is taking care of its own element, corresponding element. And uh, this is a vector, no, that's probably the same thing. Let's look at the main here. This one a little bit more complicated compared to the previous one. Uh, for the first line here, I'm first line talking about a, uh, star A, star B, star C. These are the arrays to point it to the vectors. If we just, um, you know, three numbers, we just need to into, uh, uh, declare those A, B, C, these are the stars. But if you want to play with the vectors, uh, you need to declare a pointer. So these are three pointers. A, B, C are pointers pointing to the address. And then you can allocate, allocate here. It's at the bottom here. Bottom three lines are trying to allocate memory on the host. And uh, this is a standard. You know, if we are learning uh, C, this should be a standard way for you to write this. And also random initial. These are just random function. I want to give uh, a random n random numbers to initialize A. That's nothing, nothing more than initialization. Uh, don't worry about that part. Let's just give random numbers to us to initialize A and B. Um, and a C here is just another random, uh, no, I'm sorry, it's just allocated. It, it's not an initialized because we are going to set the value to be A plus B anyway. We don't need to worry about the initial value. But A and B need to be randomized because we need the value in A and B to calculate those. So also look at the second, uh, Block here about memory allocation. So we are declare a, you know, a pointer to pointer uh, because the device A is already a pointer. We need to divide a pointer to pointer so that we can we can have a reference to the uh, to the vector itself. So it's a one more star uh, for those of you who are not familiar with this. This might be complicated, but uh, just consider we are trying to grab the whole string here instead of just, oh, I'm sorry, whole vector here. So instead of just a one vector or one number. So that's why we need two stars uh, to get the reference to the reference of the starting, uh, uh, the very first uh, um, uh, value where it is located. So in the memory, in the global, uh, in the GPU memory, that's the second chunk. So now we just need to do the copy from DA from A to DA from you know A and B. Those are random numbers. We copy them to device memory, and then we do the same. We, we do the addition uh, on n blocks, and then we do the after we get after that is done. Um, remember here here if you don't put any um, you know extra decorators or I'm um, sorry, there is a, a synchronous launch here, but here we are doing this launching uh, asynchronously in the sense that we wait until this launch is done, then we can calculate when we do the next one. So, so the main copy is done after the whole uh, launch kernel is returned, after the, the whole kernel is, uh, is done and the control is returned back to the, to the main function. And then the kernel main copy will happen. So now we are copying data from the device to the host. And then finally we free up, uh, free up all the memory. So we are not just freeing up the memory for GPUs, but also the host. These three functions are just standard uh, CPU function, uh, C function for free memory box. So now with the unified memory, since it will be a little bit easier, we don't need to do the memory copy anymore. We just need to allocate the memory, but with a manage Function. There is a one keyword, so like CUDA malloc managed, and the and the return will be allocated with a you know with a certain um, uh, uh, across the, the CPU and memory. So what it does, it will allocate both memory on CPU and GPU and keep synchronizing with you, without you to worry about it. Um, the synchronization will be done will be called before you really want to use the data for anything. Otherwise, this will be automatically handled by the by the by CUDA runtime. So each time that you want to synchronize, you need to call it. Yeah, every time. No, no. Every time you want to 
use that on your CPU, you need to do the synchronization to make sure that that will be copied back to your CPU for you to use. But by default, this will be, everything will be done on, CPU, on the GPU automatically, you know, whatever you'll be doing like with vector addition, this will, by default, it knows the data will be available, the memory block will be available on GPU, it will do all that. But if you, <coughs> sorry, <coughs> but if you don't do the CUDA device synchronization, um, your CPU memory won't be updated. Okay, so in case like I want to copy from the CPU into the GPU, like when I uh, currently I don't think like there is any initialization on that. I want to initialize. Oh, you you need to call a uh, device synchro as well before that. After you, for example, after you uh, now allocated memory, uh, manage managed memory uh, return here. If you initialize it on your CPU. You need to call a CUDA device synchronize to make sure that the, the, the it's it's all automatic copy to CPU or to to the GPU. And so is it the same function to copy from? Uh, it's it's a kind of different. Uh, yes, I think what you are doing, what you are saying, is right. But here, uh, for the mem copy, uh, wait a second. You needed to do this for every wearable separately, okay. and you needed to handle this. Make sure you need to handle this carefully yourself. Um, uh, but but, but the, the, the problem is the, the, the beauty about this one is that you can do them uh, memory uh, allocated. Uh, how, you can do them CUDA managed memory allocation called a unified memory for multiple, uh, you know, uh, for multiple variables. And you just need to call one single function to synchronize all of them. Otherwise you need to do the memory copy for each one and kind of tedious and also make your code look you know, messy. But, this one, you just whenever you need to uh, get data to the CPU uh, and to the GPU, you do the synchronization once and you are done. And that will be reducing a lot of uh, you know, mem copy bank force money. But technically, you're doing the exact same thing. But it's just make sure you know, uh, all the data will be synchronized to have the same value on both CPU and GPU. And finally, you, you do the CUDA3 for that uh, variable allocated, and that's it. So yourself many mem copies back and forth for different variables but you know it's it's just simpler to do it this way you are not saving a lot of uh you know time taking to transfer data you just save you're just saving typing the, the part the coding part so this is another one and i think you know this is a easier one you can you can declare this in at the top as a global function and a global memory block as a, as a very beginning just underscore, underscore, manage, underscore, underscore. Then you can save another statement. You don't even need to manage, you know, malloc this. This will be used as a global uh, variable. This actually, because for most of the GPU-based applications, like CUDA applications, we share all the memories anyway. So this is actually pretty regular usage. Global memory is not recommended. Global variables are not recommended for writing C code, but uh, when you're writing CUDA code, this is actually a good practice. If you know, know for sure these are the variables you'll be dealing with anyway, declare them and manage them directly like this, it will be uh, saving you a lot of you know, uh, uh, code inside your CUDA code. So you just saved this um, you know, malloc managed uh, statement with this one string uh, managed at the top. So, uh, you know, I'll share you more uh, slides um, probably after this before you go. Um, I, the previous last couple of years, I have been preparing like more than 100 slides on the details about the, the thread blocks and all the things we talked about. And, and um, I didn't include them today, mainly because we want to get you all hands dirty and to, on our device, on our uh, computers. So I'll stop today with some brief review about which, which we learned so far. And I'll send you all the slides. You can play with all the other parts later on. And uh, again, uh, we need to know, you know, the best idea. We have a host device. Those are like a one and zero. You need to play with both. You need to know, you know, where you are, which function you're calling, and if this function is sitting on the device or host, you need to have a clear picture in your mind. And all the keywords like a global. And I didn't mention here that the device they're also host. You can, those are the keywords you can use to define your functions explicitly. If you don't define those, those will be defined by default, those will be considered as a host functions. 
And then when you start doing all the calculation on GPUs, you need to allocate memory on GPU, copy memory to the GPU, do the calculation, and copy the memory back, and then free the memory. So memory management is actually a, it's a pretty big thing uh, for CUDA programming. And then you can launch n copies of the same function multiple times on n cores here, n blocks, actually corresponding to n cores anyway. You can use this block index x to access every block index. And you can also use a thread index, but I'll show you something. And nvprof, if you are using Grace, uh, you cannot use nvprof because the on Grace, the latest um, uh, GPU and the CUDA version doesn't support nvprof anymore. Uh, there is a new um, a GUI, as I, I believe it's called a uh, NV site or whatever. Uh, I, I forgot the other one, but we have been using NVprof on Terra and uh, other nodes that we have been using uh, here at, uh, you know, on HPLC systems. It has been working well. On Terra, you can still use NVprof. It give you a, this is a very simple profile filing tool and it give you the percentage of time, percentage of time taken for a particular function. You can easily see how much time is taking, but the latest version of NVIDIA seems to be not providing this, but they have the command line as well. I don't have that with me here, but uh, I can find them hopefully you know, in the future and we can talk about that later on. But you don't need to worry about this at this point. Just get yourself maybe the basic concept should be good enough. There are some more resources and the best way to go is just NVIDIA website. They have the CUDA community and our ecosystem and uh, there is a very beautiful GUI uh, based on Eclipse. And you can also integrate that uh, CUDA IDE with uh, probably uh, Visual Studio and other things. I never looked into Visual Studio myself, but uh, I used uh, Eclipse myself for CUDA programming. So the unified memory, I think it's already, I mentioned about this once, but these are some example you can try out. I, I didn't go into details and uh, Others will be more or less like, you know, when you launch all this uh, in, a different, uh, in, in different ways. So once I want to mention is the here, particularly, it's the, the device information. If you look at this, the maximum number of threads per block, it's 1,022 or 24 on, vid, uh, on the, I'm sorry, 1,024 on A100 nodes. So basically, that's why we are using number of blocks. If you look at here, the maximum dimension of the grid size, which is actually number of blocks, it's about one, two, about two billion blocks. So you can go up to two billion blocks, but you can only go up to one thousand threads. Basically, the second index. You know, we have using n one, right? The so one, the second one, index can only go up to one thousand twenty-four, even with the latest. Um, CUDA programming, uh, you know, uh, capabilities with the latest version of CUDA and the GPUs. So that's a major, one of the major difficulties uh, to, uh, not a bad, that's one of the major limitations for you to use multiple threads per second, uh, per block. So that's why we're using number block, which could be going up to 2 billion. So it's, it's a huge number. Uh, you really don't. This for this specific GPU. Uh, this for this specific GPU, uh, if you check some, you know, previous version, it's the same. And it's about similar. If for even older ones, they might be smaller. This number might be changing by in multiple versions of GPUs. But for the latest two versions, they have a consistent uh, you know, number of uh, dimensions available for you to use. So if you're just using one big array, um, and it's probably easiest to just use a number of blocks as an index ID instead of threads. Because for threads, you have to consider how you want to divide into multiple blocks so that you can keep each, each block uh, to you. You can keep the number of threads in each block limited to 1,024. Okay, does it make sense? Okay. I have one question. I see there's the cache here. You can do cache size. It is some, 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 some number. Uh, which line is it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, 69.1456 bytes. Uh, I can cache. Seven or line. Oh, this is a like L2 cache size. These are shared, like I think, a six uh, megabytes. So my question is: so for GPUs, like how does like how is the memory distributed? What does cache mean for in, in the GPUs? 
so the GP memory they have a cache uh, assigned. Um, how can I say it's, a, it's a, like a cache between your your all the GPU calls to the main memory, and inside each we call a WAP. We have a thirty two block thirty two uh, uh, cores inlet. There is a shared memory. That's the intermediate level of critical. So you need to figure out how to deal with this shared memory efficiently. So each shared memory is probably it's very small. I'm not sure it's a couple of megabytes or something. Um, and every 32 cores will share this memory. So you have this shared memory more or less like a level, level, level one cache something. And then you have a level two cache, give you the cache between the main memory and all the cores. And then you have the main memory. Um, so, so in general, for GPUs, the memory is much closer to the compute nodes, right? Compared to a CPU. Yes, for what I'm just mentioned about the uh, fine control of the cache is mostly about this shared memory. For L2 cache, because it's between the memory, main memory and all the cores, it's not something you, uh, the CUDA, want you to control that. That's more or less for systematic caching for some data. But for the uh, shared memory, you know, shared by 32 cores, those are the parts, that's the memory we can control. We can decide how we want to lay out, what kind of data we want to copy them. And that's something you know, needed to be covered in the intermediate or the most put our courses. So, but I'll, I'll send you all the, the, some information about that. That's, you know, okay, that's it's already four past the uh, last minute. So you can, if you want, you can go to, um, uh, logging grace and try out some other examples with what we I showed you today, and uh, I think you all should be good just to start trying something out and uh, you know don't break our system. Can you give us an example of something that we could use that could use the GPU very well, like some simple operation like a dark product? I don't. Know, yeah, there's there's um if you go to let me show you one this example here. Show the advantage of the GPU. Yeah. Let me. Where's my? Let me log in this one more time. Just one second. So when you download the CUDA, there, there is always a sample library coming for free. You know, they are distributing a lot of very interesting samples in different areas. And after you mount and module load the CUDA, okay? This is what I usually do. Just read NVCC. You can find out where this CUDA um, is installed, okay? And then you can check, you can LS this directory. Here. Under this, you'll see samples. And under these samples, you can find a lot of applications um, in different uh, you know, areas. You can copy the sample to your old home directory or scratch, you know, copy them to your scratch space. And you can play with those. You can directly compile those because it's already, uh, after you get to this CUDA, loaded, CUDA library loaded, you can directly compile those, and you can play with those. Yeah. I have some copied here, I believe a CUDA sample. And uh, I think this is some older version. Uh, probably I was copied from some old uh, CUDA samples, but the same idea, you can just you know, copy. Since I already loaded my uh, CUDA library, this, this is a copying some older version of CUDA code, you know, created you know, based on some older version of CUDA, but it's compatible with current version of CUDA I'm using. And uh, after it's compiled, you can find those inside the, the Bing directory. There are so many of them, like the device query. This will print out the information I showed you all today. Can you see that? Okay, yeah. And also the device query information uh, is you can you can you can directly go to the sample code and take a look at the sample code. These are more or less like in your your code back. Whenever you need to do something, just go there and look for the code. You can copy and paste and, and do things yourself based on what they are providing. 
like a sample here, let me go to the device query. This is, for example, the very simple, a very simple uh, code. And showing you how to get a query for, you know, this is a, don't worry about the top part. These are just helping you to, you know, uh, get some attributes. This is the main code. Um, um, I think a device query is a function you, you just call to get the structure and you just print out the structure. This is the, this is amazing. This is a, this is the one just to call the function to save the structure of the, all the hardware information into a, into a structure here, device property defined here. And then you just need to print out all the members of that structure and, uh, and that's it. There are many similar similar examples, and you can go there. Are also, you know, FT, FDTD, you know, and other very simple simulations, and even FFT simulations. Those are very good examples. You can also find this online. There are many online samples to get started. Sure. Thank you all so much. Um, hopefully, I'll see you all next week. I'll be teaching Julian, and you know. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we'll have a session on junior. It's about, I, I have similar slides uh, prepared last semester, but I don't think I'll be updating a lot, but it should, should be similar slides. Same time.